Okay, so now we're going to return to our the other output that we got from Excel, that big stuff at the top, uh, like the R squared, the adjusted R squared, uh, the F stat, significance F. Right. Well, the material that we were looking at before is at the bottom with the p-score and the and the coefficient are judging uh, each individual uh, variable in our regression. The stuff above, look at our regression as a whole. So here we see the regression from before. This is, of course, Ray, my professor data, using both difficulty to predict quality and the hot dummy variable to to, pit, uh, to um, predict quality. And we had, you know, statistical significance on both of them, uh, with as predicted a negative coefficient for difficulty. So, a harder professors get lower ratings and a positive coefficient for the hot dummy variable more attractive professors get higher ratings but the first thing that excel outputs is this stuff this gives us an idea of the model as a whole it includes r squared adjusted r squared f and significance f those are the four things we're going to be discussing today uh, the other stuff we'll probably reference uh, especially in the ANOVA, that's that area right there. The uh, analysis of variance is what it stands for. And it gives us a, a really good idea of the model of the whole. So let's actually start there. That's a good place to start. You see at the bottom we have uh, the SS. SS stands for sum of squares. I think I mentioned this before. So we have the residual sum of squares, the regression sum of squares, and the total sum of squares. The regression sum of squares, or what I typically refer to as the explained sum of squares, to give it a different acronym than the residual, the explained sum of squares is the squared difference between the predicted value and the average summed. So we have a predicted y minus an average y summed. Oh, I'm sorry, squared. And then summed. As discussed, the residual sum of squares is the difference between what we predict and what we observe, our residual, and then that value is squared and then summed across all observations. Then another i is an i there. It's technically only there. Of course, there's no i for y average, y bar, uh, because that's the same for the entire uh, for the entire data set. Chairs a little squeaky. So, in other words, here is our average, that blue uh, y bar. Here is our predicted value y hat and here is our observed value that individual dot the explained sum of squares the explained sum of squares is the difference between these two the residual sum of squares captures the difference between these two this is ess this is rss or rather this technically is just the explained part, that's the residual, and then the SS part comes from doing that for all observations, and then squaring each one of those and then adding them all together. So total sum of squares, or TSS, is equal to simply uh, the explained sum of squares plus the residual sum of squares. We see that here. So here's our explained sum of squares. Here's our residual sum of squares. And then if we add them together, we get our total sum of squares. It's all right there. R squared equals the explained sum of squares divided by the total sum of squares. You can think of R squared as being the percent of the deviation that the regression explains. Like we have all of these observations. Some are above the mean and some are below the mean. 
and we don't know why some are above and some are below. But when we throw a regression in, we can explain a certain percent of that deviation. We can explain why some observations are higher than the mean, and we can explain why some observations are lower than the mean. Think, for example, this. Right? If we didn't know anything, you would think it's, the, it's um, this observation, this individual person or household or country or state or whatever the element is. This individual, whatever it is, should be here, but it's all the way down here. We can explain part of why it's so low. We can explain part of why it's so low, but we cannot explain the whole thing. This is the whole thing. This is what we can explain. And so this gives us some idea as to how much we can explain, how much we know, how much our regression is adding. That is one judgment of the quality of the regression. Now, a quick note, again, on notation and on, on, on um, verbiage. Some people refer to the explain sum of squares as the regression sum of squares. You see that in the Excel output. And some people refer to the residual sum of squares as the error sum of squares. Obviously, this is confusing because... I call this ESS, explain sum of squares, and residual sum of squares, RSS. Other people, though, will look at explain sum of squares and say that's the residual sum of squares. And they will also look at the residual sum of squares and say, oh, that's the error sum of squares. So note, you have to be very careful about terminology. In this class, you will always talk in terms of explained and residual because I don't personally like the term error. It sounds like someone did something wrong and explained has the virtue of thinking in terms of like what we are trying to do with this regression. We're trying to explain variation and deviation from the mean. But I just want you to be aware of that difference in terminology. Here's the thing though with R squared. It has a problem. By, math, by definition, by just the sheer power of the maths, the more explanatory variables you throw into the regression, R squared would always increase. No matter how good those explanatory variables are, no matter if, the, if they're statistically significant or not, R squared always increases because you naturally have more ways to explain variation. You know, if this is a little bit lower and you throw another, vari uh, another variable in, well, maybe whatever that... Um, that variable's value is that observation can help explain a little bit of that deviation. That, of course, doesn't mean it's valuable. So the statisticians have come up with a way for penalizing people to add observations. Right. R squared is nice. It's very intuitive. But something that is more meaningful is adjusted R squared. And adjusted R squared adjust for the number of explanatory variables you have. Here's our equation. It's adjusted R squared is equal to 1 minus 1 minus R squared times uh, n. Well, n is the number of observations. K is the number of explanatory variables, the number of x's. Note this does not include the intercept. Some versions of this equation do not have that minus 1 there, but k includes the intercept. So you know, it doesn't really matter as long as you know what you're doing. But I find it a little bit easier to think in terms of k just are the number of variables you threw into the regression. Uh, if you threw in 1, then k is 1. If you have two, like we do here right, with our two variables, k is 2. This is 1 minus r squared. So what we will do if we were to do this by hand is we will then look at whatever's left over, which would be the residual sum of squares divided by total sum of squares. Right. This is by definition the amount that we cannot explain. Note that this value will always be greater than 1 because the only difference between the numerator and the denominator 
is we're subtracting the number of observations of the uh, number of explanatory variables. So that means that the numerator will always be larger, which means this total amount will always be greater than one. Which means we'll take this value that's greater than one, multiply it by the stuff we cannot explain, and we'll get a larger amount. And then we will take one minus that to return back to R squared. R squared, uh, I'm sorry, R squared adjusted is always less than regular R squared. Adjusted R squared is always less than unadjusted R squared. It has to be by definition. Because this one minus one thing, that kind of cancels out. So the only thing we're doing is we're uh, taking one minus R squared to pull out the stuff we cannot explain, making it larger by multiplying it by a value that's greater than one. We're going to take one minus R squared, which is the stuff we cannot explain, multiply it by a value greater than one, which makes it larger by definition. And then do one minus this larger amount to get adjusted R squared. Adjusted R squared has to always be lower. Our numerator is equal to N minus one. So we have 211 observations minus one. Our denominator is N minus K, which is two explanatory variables minus one. This divided by, oops, so this divided by this, of course, will be greater than one. And then if we take one minus the quantity of one minus R squared and multiply it, I can't buy P30. We get the same thing. Appreciate how important N is. The only reason why we have such similar values between adjusted R squared and R squared in this case is because N is huge and we only have two explanatory variables. We have 211 observations. We have two explanatory variables, so our, the value that we're multiplying um, this unexplained part by is just over one. So we're getting function of very similar results, 65.1, 65.1, you can think of it as a percent if you want, 65.1% uh, uh, versus 64.8%. You know, 0.651 versus 0.648. It's a very similar number. Let's see what happens then, just to illustrate it. Let's see what happens if we reduce our observations from 211 to 5. Note what happens. Our adjusted R squared used to be about the same. Now it is much smaller. It is 0.3. It's like 0 0.302. It's less than half. So one of the nice things about this is R squared, adjusted R squared uh, penalizes you for adding additional explanatory variables, for adding additional X's. By definition, the X's automatically cause R squared to increase. So you really have to make sure each, each X earns its keep, so to speak. But at the same time, if you have a lot of observations, you are free to add a lot of uh, explanatory variables. If we had 5 or 10 or even 15 or 20, the difference between R squared and adjusted R squared would not be that big because we have over 200 observations. But if we only have 5 observations, then just 2 explanatory variables really messes with our ability to understand what's going on. We can see that here. If I just change the denominator rather than having two, let's have 20. You see, it's still very similar. Uh, rather than having two x's, two explanatory variables, I would have 20 different things. I don't know what they would all be, but maybe I have had 20 of them. Then you see it's still functionally, we're getting over you know 60% of the explanatory, uh, you know, 
uh, just r squared is is still over 0.6. That seems pretty good. Okay. So this model seems to be pretty good as a whole. So the thing to remember about r squared is that there is no defined standard as to what a, what a good r squared is and, and what it isn't. With hypothesis testing, with p values, we have these very clear lines. 0 0.05, 0 0.01, 0 0.001, and p-values less than that, statistically significant, done. But with R-squared, it's more of a sort of intuitive idea as to how much you're explaining and what percent. But just because it's 0.3, that doesn't mean it's bad. Just because it's 0 0.8, that doesn't mean it's good. It does depend on the context that we're looking at. So some things that are very, very difficult to explain Things that are subject to lots of variation and lots of different influences, uh, like how long someone will live, you know, which depends on diet and exercise and background and mental health and all of these things. If you can explain 30% what's going on, that's pretty good. But for something like, if we're talking about like if you're shooting things from a catapult and you can explain 80% of where something lands based on things like how tightly you pulled the catapult and uh, what angle you set the catapult at and uh, the ground, for example, the topography of the ground and uh, the weight of the object it throws and you put all those things in and you can explain 80%. I mean, I guess that's fine, but it's not that impressive because where an object lands is purely a matter of physics. Uh, there's not a lot of random variation there, as there's airspeed and so forth. But generally speaking, it's it's not that impressive if you can do 70-80%. Certainly not 70-80% of stock market movements, right, which are much more difficult to predict. It's not that looking at adjusted R-squared or R-squared is a bad way to judge the quality of the regression. There are very, very low values that are definitely like, well, that's not very helpful regression. You know, if it's, if it's like a 0.01 or 0.02. It's like, what are you doing? And there are ones that are definitely good. Like if it's 0.99 or 0.98, that's definitely good. But a 0.65 in this context, I think is pretty good. Judging the quality professor, 65% of the variation you can explain by how, uh, if they're attractive or not and their difficulty, that's not bad at all. So there's a massive gray area as to what's good and what's not. But it's nice to look at. Well, it's nice to look at. It gives a good intuition. We do have a more scientific or mathematic, uh, mathematical way to do it that maps well with our statistically significant story. And that's our F-stat. Our F-stat is a ratio of variances. You see that MS there? That MS stands for mean square. There's a mean square for the regression. It's a mean square for the residual, and it's essentially variances. The mean square for the regression is the variance of the mean square for the regression is the explained variance, and the mean square for the residual is the unexplained variance. You can see where this MS comes from because MS is equal to our sum of squares. Uh, I explained some of squares divided by our degrees of freedom. And our uh, MS residuals is equal to our residual sum of squares divided by its degrees of freedom. Right, we have two degrees of freedom here because we have two explanatory variables. And so, and we have one explanatory variable dedicated to our Y value or what we're predicting. And so if we have 211 observations, we take out uh, three total Two for the two x's, one for the y, and uh, 211 minus 3 is 208. And then the f stat is simply first variance divided by the second. Like t values, f stats map with a distribution. And like t values, f stats are family of distribution degree, uh, depending on degrees of freedom. So our significance f is like a p value. It is statistically significant if it's less than 0.05 or 0.01 or 0.001. This is, of course, way less than 0.001, right? Remember that E it represents scientific notation. So this is 
decimal point with 47 zeros and then 288. It is very, 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 very small. This is a statistically significant regression. This model as a whole is good. I'm thinking in terms of the model as a whole is good because we can throw in other explanatory variables all we want. Hey, we have 211 observations. Why not? Okay, let's take a look at another aspect of multivariate regression. Uh, we can go into time and total data for this one. This is a pretty fun one. So this one comes from a conversation I had with a friend of mine back in graduate school. We were thinking, what do we suppose the relationship is between how well a student does on the exam and how long it takes them to complete the exam? And he thought it made kind of an inverted U. And I'm like, I don't really know if that's the case. And he was like, no, 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 no. If they're not taking very long, they have no idea what's going on, they're just going to score very low. If they're taking a really long time, they also don't know what's going on. They're desperate, and they're just trying to think of the answer. And I'm like, you know, that might be true. But it also might be that they are just taking as much care as they possibly can and trying to think of answers. And, you know, it's if they're spending some time trying to think of it or thinking about the question, you know, Assuming they're using that well, there's a higher probability they will think of the right answer, and, and maybe they'll do better. I gathered some data some years ago on this, and I have it here. This is time and total data. So, you know, each our element is students, and each one of these represents the students, each one of these um, rows. And this is how well they did on the exam. This is a dummy variable for their gender, if they're female or not. This is their year. So are they a freshman, which is one, uh, a, a junior, I'm sorry, a sophomore, which is two, a junior, which is three. Uh, time is the amount of time in minutes it took them to complete the exam. Uh, this exam was based on you know, two homeworks directly related to this exam, homework three and homework four. So this is uh, how well they did on each of those homeworks. And then the total, so that's just the two added together. So you could run a regression to see if it's if it has an inverted u shape and I, I checked this it doesn't really uh, but it is more of a linear relationship as i initially suspected but what's cool is now we can figure out if you spend more time on the exam how much more does it add to your final total if you take the maximum amount of time if you're done say 20 minutes early and you said, you know what, I'm going to take this 20 minutes. I'm going to really go over this exam and make sure I didn't miss anything and, and make sure all my answers are correct and make sure I showed all my work and et cetera, et cetera. If I take this additional 20 minutes, how much more can my exam, I can I expect to go up? If I don't think it'll, you know, if it turns out that it doesn't go up at all, that's interesting. That means you shouldn't be spending that extra time and you should go do something else because it's a waste of time otherwise. But maybe it adds a lot. And you should really spend the amount of time. Maybe it's not statistically significant. Maybe it is. Let's run a regression. Data. Data analysis. Regression. Let's just do a very straightforward one. So we're going to have for our Y. Oh, yeah. I have, looks like I have 39 observations. Note this starts in two because I put in some information here about what it was, you know, because I have two and so forth. And then here's time, how long they spent. That's, of course, what I'm using to predict. And I'm going to create an output. So I am, just by looking at time, explaining 18%, roughly 18% of the variation. I know that this is a pretty big drop from before, even though I have only one explanatory verb, because I'm only working with 39 observations. Our F stat, though, is pretty big. It's 8, and we can tell it's big because it's statistically significant. Right? It is statistically significant, not at 99.9%, .9%, but at 99%. That's pretty good. I'll take that. 
So just by looking at how long people take, it looks like I can tell what's going on. And of course, as you know, these are the same because I only have one explanatory variable. That's not a coincidence right there. That's pretty neat. Uh, and it looks like the coefficient is for every additional minute you spend taking the exam, your exam score goes up by 0.85 points. That's pretty good. That's for every minute. It's nearly a whole point that you get on the exam. Spend 10 minutes, that's an additional 8 points. 20 minutes, that's that's actually 17 points because it's 8 point. It's, you know, 10 minutes is 8.5. So 20 minutes would be a uh, would be 17. That's huge. <laughs> Just by spending 20 more minutes. <laughs> Take the full time on your exams. I really want to update this. I really want to get a bigger sample size and see if it holds, um, especially since this data is so old. But, you know, basic idea. We can expand on this. Let's just, let's do another analysis. We have all this other data. Let's just throw everything in. Why not? Let's throw, let's throw these four. Let's start with these four. So this is female, year, time, and age total. And I'm going to print it here. So immediately note our R squared increased. It was 18, 0.18. Now it's 0.38. Our adjusted R squared is also higher than before, right? It was 0.16, now it's 0.301, but we shouldn't be surprised if it's, it's gone up as well, uh, just because our R squared has gone up so much. Uh, our significance F has gone down, suggesting a higher level of statistical significance, even though our F stat has also gone down. Right? The reason why our F stat is lower is because we removed uh, degrees of freedom and we moved them into regression. And so, of course, because, you know, mean squared is equal to the sum of squares divided by degrees of freedom, this is going to go down. But that consideration is thrown into this uh, significance F. So that's why even though our set is lower, our significance F is also lower. Yeah, whatever, right. What's, what's really cool, though, is our PVS. So I want to take a look at what's statistically significant. I want to know what matters, what doesn't. Um, so time still matters. Always nice to see. Statistically significant, not at 99.9% .9 like we had before. Um, well, that wasn't even statistically significant. Not statistically significant um, at 99% anymore. But still statistically significant. Homework total, also statistically significant. So that makes sense too, of course. right? We, I, I threw that in. Right? The story was uh, I can't measure knowledge directly. That's the point of the exam, after all, is to figure out how much people know. But presumably people who did better on the homework probably know more because they have demonstrated the ability to understand the material than the people who did not do well on the homework. So it's kind of trying to get a proxy for some pre-existing state of knowledge going into the exam so it's not surprising that statistically significant. The better you do on the homework, the better you do on the exam. You can think of it as practice. The coefficient went down a little bit, but not much. Uh, year doesn't matter. This was one that really surprised me. I thought that students who've been there longer, they would have more experience. They would do better on the exams. doesn't really matter. Maybe it's just because I didn't have a lot of variation and I couldn't tease out the effect, but it doesn't really matter. I was, though, kind of happy to see that female no, gender doesn't matter. So... Uh, it's not like I, on some subtle unconscious level, are penalizing men or penalizing women, right? It, it's not statistically significant. So that's good to see. So we have two statistically significant values. You know what? Let's go even farther. Hey, we know homework total matters. Let's see which homework is more important. Throw that in there. Look at that. So it looks like our R squared um, obviously went up, as mentioned. But our adjusted R squared is lower, 0.3, rather than 0.31. That's a little strange. Hmm. Maybe the variables that we added aren't really doing much. <laughs> 
Uh, so this is still statistically significant, right? Basically the same there. Uh, you know, uh, female still doesn't matter. Year still doesn't matter. Time still matters. What is this? Homework total doesn't matter? And then we got this weird error term. And then what is this right here, right? Homework four is like, whatever. We don't know what's going on. What is going on? Here's what's going on. We misspecified our model. You can figure out homework total by just looking at homework three and four, because homework total equals homework three and four. And so Excel noted the perfect correlation that we had put into our model. And it recognized one of those variables, in this case, homework four, as completely redundant. And it just kicked it out. That's why we have these, like, essentially all these error terms everywhere. That's why also a uh, homework total is just rendered statistically not significant anymore. Oh, we made a mess of the model. We have some what uh, some we have something called multicollinearity. Say it with me. Multicollinearity. Multicollinearity. Multicollinearity is when two explanatory variables, so two x, x's, two different x's, are highly correlated with one another. We can see that here. Correlation coefficient. That's very high correlation, 0.9. A very high correlation, 0.86. This one though isn't as bad, 0.56. That's that's not highly correlated, but uh, because homework total is determined by adding these two together, naturally it is highly correlated with any one of those other ones. Which is why I dropped one of them. So, if we wanted to know which homework was more important, we would not include homework total because it's so highly correlated with homework three and four, but three and four are not highly correlated with each other. There is no strict definition of what high correlation is. For our purposes though, we're gonna use plus or minus 0.8 as a threshold. If it is greater than 0.8, greater than or equal to 0.8, or less than or equal to 0.8, we're just gonna say for purposes of this class, generally speaking, that's too highly correlated. You have two redundant variables. And that's why multicollinearity is a problem because you have two variables that are functionally doing the same thing. You can't untangle the effect of any one from the other. Let me show you. Here we have a hypothetical of cupcakes. So maybe I'm a baker. And I'm trying to figure out which cupcake recipe I wanna use. And so I make a whole bunch of different cupcakes and then I rate them. Or I have uh, customers rate them. And maybe the ones with two cups of sugar and two cups of butter get rated an eight. People love them. Oh, they're so buttery and sweet. Oh, it's delightful. Well, the ones with 0.3 sugar and 0.5 butter, 0.3 cups and 0.5 cups, they, the people hate them, rate a one. Now, do they not like them because there's not a lot of sugar? Or do they not like them because there's not a lot of butter? And I don't know. I don't know because they are highly correlated. Very highly correlated. I can't untangle the results. So this person really hate it because it's, it's, it's uh, too like bitter or do they really hate it because it's, it's just, it, it doesn't like goo well.
or it's kind of crumbly or whatever it is when you take out a lot of butter. Does this person love it because they it's so sweet or is it because it's so buttery? Right, we don't know. In order to solve this problem, we would have to do something akin to a control, right? We would have to have some of them have lots of butter and little sugar, and some of them have lots of sugar and little butter, and then we can begin to tease out the effects. Right now, it counts like that's clearly highly correlated. We don't know. What we need are low sugar, high butters, high sugar, low butters. And note, not only when we do that, we can more easily tease out the relationship, but now it's no longer highly correlated. Right now, it's just kind of a mess, which is kind of what we want. This is what we did, too, with housing. Remember when we did the housing uh, example? We're trying to figure out um, what influences the price of housing. Yeah, distance from the city center, but the houses get smaller as they get farther away from the city center. If those two variables, size and distance, were highly correlated, we wouldn't be able to untangle the results. Is this this price because it's small or because it's far away? Well, always a good idea to check. We don't want to have any multicollinearity. So here's our square foot variable. Here's our miles from the city center variable. Hit enter. No, 0.26, very low correlation, right? That's good. That means that in this data, we have big houses that are near the city, so they would be super expensive. We have small houses that are far out, so they should be super cheap. And that allows us to tease out the effects of these individual variables, uh, which are normally be highly correlated. Excel can recognize perfect correlation, and it will automatically drop things that are perfectly correlated. But in practice, as mentioned, you typically don't get variables that are perfectly correlated. The only reason why it noticed the mistake here is because the mistake I made was so blaringly obvious, right? Obviously, if you if a homework total is found between any of these two homeworks, it's going to recognize that perfect correlation, you know, between these two variables and this one. So in practice, you need a correlation table of the independent variables to show there is no multicollinearity. You would not, in showing no multicollinearity, include your dependent variable. It doesn't matter if one of your independent variables is highly correlated with your dependent variable, if one of your x's is highly correlated with your y. Multicollinearity happens when two x's are highly correlated with each other, rendering them, one of them redundant. If you include your dependent variable in your correlation table, it shows you don't know why you're including your correlation table. In your paper for this semester, you will be required to include a correlation table. Only make it for the independent variables. Don't include it for the dependent variable because then you're saying, I don't know why I'm doing this. I'm just following instructions. All right, that's bad. <laughs> don't do that. All right, only have it for your independent variable. And of course, you want it to have no multicollinearity. You don't want to have any correlation coefficient that is above 0.8 or below negative 0.8. To solve multicollinearity, if you do have highly correlated variables, you got to remove one of them. You don't need to remove all of them, just the one that's creating the problem. If you have two variables that are highly correlated with each other, then that means you only need to take out one of them and replace it with something else. You don't need to take out both. The problem is not the mere existence of, of, of one of them. The problem is not that the problem is not both of them. The problem is both of them together. If you remove one, the other one is fine. And you need to be able to check for multicollinearity. Now, just because you remove one, though, it doesn't mean that you're done, right? As a side note for your paper, this is a multivariant regression. So you will need to also include a replacement variable that's not highly correlated. This is why, by the way, for your proposal, I told you to make these variables very different from one another, because if you make all your explanatory variables very similar, you're more likely to get multicollinearity. Right, try to make them very different.
multicollinearity is bad. It's bad because it will lead you to type two error for one. So you see in our analysis, when we had highly correlated variables, the p-value inflated huge because the explanatory power of that variable is split and therefore you can't really tell what's going on. Uh, but we know that it is statistically significant. We know from previous models, it is statistically significant. So we would be making type two error if we included homework three and four, because we'll be like, well, I guess we, ha we uh, have to fail to reject our null hypothesis. I guess homework total doesn't matter when of course it does. Okay, so that's the end of this section. Uh, we're gonna then next class, or I should say our next video, finish up thinking about regressions and go over a couple of miscellaneous ideas. Bye.